Good morning. Welcome to Maysville this morning. If you're visiting with us, we are delighted to have you to be a part of our worship service this morning. If you are visiting and don't mind filling out one of those blue cards on the back of the pews in front of you, uh, pass those towards the center aisles. Our ushers will come down in just a few moments to collect those and have a record of your attendance. And also stick around for a few minutes afterwards and we can get a chance to meet you and make you feel welcome here at Maysville and invite you back again soon. Opening song will be number 153 this morning. Number 153. We've got several announcements to go through, so uh, hang in here with me for just a couple of minutes. Um, if you haven't noticed, we did have a flood in the bathroom, um, I guess, this, this past week. Uh, the bathrooms are functional from what I understand, but uh, just bear with us through the uh, drying out process. Carpets will have to be uh, re-cleaned again, especially around the men's restroom side. And um, so just be mindful of that and kind of tolerate the, uh, the work going on, and we'll get that taken care of. If uh, anyone's graduating from high school or college uh, in 2013, please give your name to Joy Marshall. Uh, that also counts for those who graduated uh, from college in December 2012, uh, so please get those to her as soon as you can. Also, we're in the uh, process of updating our memorial plaques on the wall in the foyer, and if you know of a member here at Maysville that's passed away whose name is not on that plaque, uh, please see Joy Marshall for that as well and give that name to her so we can make those preparations to get our plaque updated. Several updates this morning on our, um, our sick, our recovery list. Um, uh, please keep in mind uh, Reva Bell, Shirley Collins' mother. Also, for those of you who may not have heard, Ron Wisnat did have a heart attack this past Wednesday night uh, immediately after our devotional portion. And uh, so please keep uh, Ron and and Betty in the prayers right now also. Uh, if you haven't heard, uh, we did have a loss. Uh, Tudor Kilpatrick did pass away last night about 1130. Uh, so let's uh, surround the Kilpatrick family and encourage them. Uh, they're lost right now. We don't have any arrangements on the preparations for the visitation or funeral. Uh, we're hoping to have those possibly tonight. Uh, we'll get those announced as soon as we have them. Please keep the Kilpatrick family in our prayers. Also, uh, Johnya Hawkins is having uh, surgery that's coming up Wednesday on a hernia. So please keep uh, Johnya in our prayers right now and the Hawkins family and her uh, speedy recovery back with us. We have uh, Virginia Sanders on our uh, prayer list as well. I do have a uh, note to read from her. Dear brothers and sisters, I'd like to thank each one of you so very much for the many ways you have shown your love and concern for me and my family. Your prayers are deeply appreciated, and all the cards are truly refreshing. I'm no longer in remission and will be entering the hospital today for a month of, uh, of taking chemo. Please continue to pray for us and that this round of chemotherapy will put me back into remission so that I can go for the bone marrow transplant. I love each of you and draw strength in knowing that uh, you care, and of course the Lord's will be done in all things. He is in control. I love Virginia Sanders. Also have an uh, update. David Robinson will begin his chemo on March the 27th. So please keep David and the Robinson family in our prayers right now also. Another note, uh, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, thank you so much for your love and support after my accident in the hospital and during my recovery at home. The visits, phone calls, flowers, gifts, and food, and especially your prayers, truly got me through a very painful and difficult time. Thanks again. I love you all. Sister Betty Hall. Don't forget about a couple of things uh, coming up on our calendar. Uh, this afternoon, don't forget the bridal shower for uh, Lonnie Beth Jones. That'll be this afternoon in the fellowship hall from 2 to 4 p.m. And she's registered at Target, Bed Bath & Beyond, and the Pottery Barn. Also, don't forget about the men's breakfast coming up. All men in the congregation are in encouraged to attend. This will be on Saturday, March the 16th, which is this coming Saturday at 8 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall. And if you haven't signed up yet, there is a sign-up list posted right outside the uh, Secretary's office. And uh, please sign up for that. If you're bringing a, a guest, please make sure that is mentioned so we can make the proper food preparations on that. Prime Timers will meet this Tuesday night at 6 o'clock. The menu is potluck and plan to be a part of that. Uh, great fellowship time. A couple of things regarding uh, puppets. The 10th grade puppet team will practice this Friday night at 6 p.m. No practice uh, will take place on Monday or Wednesday. 
but please make every effort to be at the church building uh, no later than 6 p.m. this coming Friday so that y'all can get started and make those, uh, make those plans. And due to some scheduling conflicts with the uh, multiple puppet practices going on right now, Bible Bowl will not meet this afternoon. However, plan to meet one final time next Sunday during uh, Bible study. Uh, please read the book of Proverbs between now and then. And also, on Last of Leaders, we've got several that are, are going that weekend, and there is going to be a shortage of teachers here for that Sunday morning. Um, so Pat Bradford has asked that you please see him, because uh, he is in need of some teachers to fill those slots uh, on the Last of Leaders weekend. And uh, that's nursery through uh, first grade, I believe it is. And um, we don't want our, our kids running rampant on the building, so uh, so please see Pat, and uh, he'll get you down to, to teach that class. And uh corral our youngsters that morning. I think that's all the announcements I have this morning. <clears throat> Again, opening song number 153. We'll have our closing prayer by Brother Brian Norris. And right now, let's begin our worship, and uh, Brother Doug Deaton will lead us in our opening prayer. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank Thee for this day. We thank Thee for this time that we can come together and sing praises to Your name. Thank Thee for Your Word that You have given us. Pray that You'll help us to look into Your Word and understand it, put it into our heart, and be an example to those that we come in contact with. Pray that You'll help us to always keep the faith. Pray that You'll help us to look for and desire that crown of righteousness which you've laid up for us. Pray that you'll be with us and help us do those things that are right. Pray that you'll help us steer away from those things that are contrary to your will. Pray that you'll be with the elders here as they guide the body. Help guide them always in the pathways of right. Pray you'll be with those that were mentioned that were ill and recovering. Pray that you'll be with Reba Bell, Paula Lindsay, and Ron Wisnat. Pray that you'll strengthen them and bring them back to the health that they desire. Pray be with Virginia Sanders and David Robinson as they undergo treatment. Strengthen and comfort them and heal them so that they can continue to be part of this family here with us. Pray you'll be with us. Pray you'll be with the Kilpatrick family and the loss of their loved one. But most of all, we thank thee for the love that you've showered down upon us and sent in your only son, down that cross so that we could one day have a home in heaven with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
602, 602. <clears throat> Be the first in the last stanza, please. <clears throat> There's a land that is Seven, 137. We turn our thoughts this morning to Jesus Christ and his supreme sacrifice at Calvary. His uh, very painful death, but yet his ultimate victory there in our purchase of possible salvation gives us reason to call him fairest Lord Jesus. Let's sing the first and the last stanzas before we partake of his supper. <coughs> First, Lord Jesus. Father, as we come before you this morning, we thank you for this opportunity of worship, realizing 
The sacrifice of your son was necessary for our salvation. Father, we realize this bread represents this broken body there. May we take it in a manner well-pleasing in your sight. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. again please our father in heaven at this time in like manner we ask you to bless this cup which represents Christ's blood that was shed on the cross may we take it in a well pleasing manner in Christ's name we pray amen
number 853, 853, we now have opportunity this morning to give back to God. Monetarily, we reminded that he provides all for us. He's been good to us. We need to be good to his cause. We'll sing the first, second, and last stanzas before we give back this morning. <clears throat> God is so Father and our God in heaven, we are thankful for this day. We are thankful for the blessing of life. We are thankful for this time of togetherness that we can come and, and worship you. God, we are in awe of the love that you show for us each day. God, we are thankful for the many talents and abilities that you provide for us and that you have blessed us with so that we can provide and earn a living for our families. We pray now that we will give back with an open and a cheerful heart. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please mark number 347. 347, we'll sing it after the lesson this morning. <clears throat> and now number 800, number 800, we'll do the first and the last stanzas. If you'd like to, please stand, join in as we sing number 800. <clears throat>
Y'all are making Brother Kerry work harder than he had to Friday night. We had a house full of singers here on Friday. If you missed out on that, you missed out on a, a very fine spiritual evening. And uh, we are thankful that we had a good week and began in a very special way. The first uh, singing like that that we've had here at Maysville. I suspect there will be some more. But uh, we appreciate so much everyone who did come. And those of you who came and brought food, we had lots of food. And we are very, very grateful for uh, that uh, fantastic turnout and uh, appreciate everybody who had a part in that. It was also a good week. If you were here with us on Wednesday night, uh, Brother Carl Reed was baptized into Christ, and uh, some of you may not know Carl. We'd want to make sure that you do. Carl, we'll ask you to stand where you're at and uh, let everybody take a look at you. We're glad to have Brother Carl with us, and we appreciate very much uh, you being a part of our congregation here at Maysville, and hope you meet Carl if you don't know him. And uh, we are thankful to be able to make a uh, announcement of that sort, and I'm sure that you'll not have any problem getting a grin from Miss Judy as well, but uh, we're glad for that. If you'll turn with me in a moment, we're going to read from Psalm 119. Of the 1189 chapters in the Bible, both the longest and the shortest are in the book of Psalms. Psalm 119 has the distinction of being the longest chapter in the Bible. It has a organization of an acrostic. Uh, there is a 22-letter Hebrew alphabet, similar to our alphabet, but we have 26 letters, A, B, C, D, E, etc. And uh, the Hebrew alphabet has 22 letters, beginning with Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, Hav, Zav, Vine, Het, etc. Well, the 57th verse begins right under, if your Bible has the the letters there, the Hebrew letter het. And let's read beginning in the 57th verse. You are my portion, O Lord. I have said that I would keep your words. I entreated your favor with my whole heart. Be merciful to me according to your word. I thought about my ways, and I turned my feet to your testimonies. I made haste and did not delay to keep your commandments. There's an interesting image there, especially those last two verses that we just read, verses 59 and 60. That of a beginning, I have turned, I've seen, I've considered, I've thought, I've changed, and I have become obedient to your will. Every year, millions of children come of age and join the ranks of countless others uh, who have come up to their birthday where they begin to go to kindergarten. And it's an interesting thing, a, a, a challenge for many mothers. Um, in, a, in a good way, you want your children to grow up and, and reach these milestones. But in a negative way, it's hard to see those little bitty ones that you're, you're raising and you've, you've held on your lap to watch them come of age where they can totter off to school and they want to go and be with the other kids at, at school. And from Maine to California and Florida to Washington, across the, the nation in large cities and towns and little hamlets and villages watching those little ones begin to gather together and go off to school is an interesting thing. Why? Why do we do that? Well, the United States law requires that every child who is of normal health and with very few exceptions uh, have to be educated. And we begin very early in that process. They'll be in school from the time that they are um, about six or seven years old up until they are 17 or 18 years old. What is the purpose for the educational system? Well, there might be a variety of answers. 
that we could come up with. But from a purely uh, national perspective, it is important for the citizens of the United States to be properly educated so that they will be able to take their place in society and fulfill the needs uh, that society has, that they will be workers who contribute to the national economy, that they'll be able to take care of their families. It takes many, many years to prepare a doctor, an engineer, an accountant, a teacher, uh, a variety of, of specialty services of scientists and everyone who's going to be trained and take on a position to serve society, there's a great deal of specialized knowledge that they're going to need, and it's going to take years of preparation for them to have the basic learning so that they will be considered in our world, educated, and provide for them. And we know that delay is expensive. You've got to start while they're young. There are lots of folks who understand that concept in regard to sports. Before I continue with my discussion of sports, I need to take care of a little bit of housekeeping. Brother Mike, could I get you to lower that blind just a little bit? I am being blinded. <laughs> Thank you very much. There are lots of parents who have started training a child in baseball or basketball or gymnastics, tennis, whatever, at a very early age. Sometimes they can hardly walk around because that parent understands that those early years of training and being able to develop a child and their coordination when they are just very small is, is a special time. You can't get that time back. Now, you can take a child that's 10 years old or whatever, and you can train them in, in some of the sports, and you can train them to do gymnastics, but they will never have that, that special edge that begins when beginning with that, that very young child learning these skills. You just can't catch up and make up for that time. We understand that concept financially. If you're involved in any kind of financial research at all, you understand that those who are providing with, uh, you with uh, information will be counseling young people, and especially those who uh, come to a place where they are of age of a, a young married couple, begin immediately squirreling away that money, taking care of your financial resources. Just invest a little bit a year at a time, and by the time you get where you're of retirement age, you will have amassed a tremendous amount of, of wealth. And those years cannot be made up. You can't start after you've been married 25 or 30 years and make up for all of those years of investing. It takes much, much, much more effort later on to even come close uh, to what would be done if you begin much earlier than that. And the same concept is true spiritually. We talk about children. And the writer of Ecclesiastes said, Remember now your Creator in the days of your youth. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1. And surely we have quoted and understand, Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he'll not depart from it. The writer of Proverbs there, Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, describes the, the, the idea that there is a, a special time. There, there's a window of opportunity that must not be missed. If I had a moment to speak very candidly to parents, I would tell you that there's an opportunity that is available to you while your children are young that you will never have again. And if you do not teach them about God when they are children, when they are babies, then you are missing out on one of the most important times to teach them about the, the most important aspects of spirituality. That God begins when a child is young. And if you teach these things, they are instilled at a level that becomes a part of them in a different way. And you need to make sure that you're carrying to go with your children to Bible class and to worship. Those early years must not be neglected. 
Delay is expensive. A second observation I'd like to make is that we know that there are lost opportunities that can never be recovered. You can't go back and make up for the mistakes of the past. You can't undo what was done. You can't get that time back again. We know that at least part of Paul's drive to serve God was a painful uh, reflection on his past. He knew where he'd been. He understood the circumstances of his life. And we find in his own words where he describes himself in 1 Timothy chapter 1. He said, I am the chief of sinners. When he saw himself and recognized where he'd been and where he'd come from, there are, beginning in that 12th verse, Paul begins to talk about his background, but by the time he comes to verse 15, he says, my, my place is, is of a man who is at the top, and, and not at the top of a good list, but at the top of a very bad list. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9, he puts himself in another list. And he said, I am the least of all the apostles. The Lord appeared to me the last as one born out of due season. He said it was like I was, I was born at the wrong time. I was not there at, at the very beginning because he persecuted the church. And that, that concept there of being born at the wrong time caused Paul to work harder. So he says in the 10th verse, We worked harder than all of the rest because of the things that had been done in the past. You can never go back. That's a challenge for all of us. And the fact that we can never go back ought to be a very sobering thought for us. For this reason, someday there will be a last chance for you to become a Christian if you were not one today. You won't go to church one Sunday and have a flashing billboard behind me on the wall that says today's your last day. It won't happen like that. It'll just be there. And you don't want to have that happen. There are none of us that can anticipate life. None of us know when the end is coming. My phone rang this morning, or the phone at the house rang. Libby came in to my office where I was looking over my lessons. And she said, do you have time to talk to Leah? I'd been expecting some phone calls. I was not expecting a phone call from my daughter. And she said they have called in the family to come see her mother-in-law, Hope Shull. They don't know how long she has to live, but her time is very short. There are times when we know in advance that there are things that are advancing upon us. We know when our age is coming on, when certain things are happening, when we begin to lose our health. But you never know when the last time will be to become a Christian. And it's not always because we're not alive. I'm sure that many of you have been in a cave before. Maybe you've been in some of the the grand caves, the Carlsbad Caverns or some of the others. Many years ago, I was up in uh, some with our children in Tennessee. You go down into a cave, and it's very likely if you're in one of these limestone caves that you'll find um, the, the great stalagmites forming on the ground. And and they are the columns that, that, that come up from the ground. And it, as the water drips down on the ground, and a little bit of, of dissolved mineral from that water will, will stay there in that spot. That sediment will form. And over time, it will begin to grow, and a column will form. And sometimes the columns from the top, the stalactites, and the column from the bottom, the stalagmites, actually merge together to this 
this single piece there. And I think about people who hear the message of the gospel and they decide not to respond to it. They go about their business. And they hear the message of the gospel again. And they don't respond to it and they go about their business. And they hear it again. And again. And again. And each time they say no. Or they say later. And I suspect that something builds up over time. Sort of like a resistance, a barrier. And it becomes perhaps harder and harder and harder to ever reach through that when someone takes on that position. And so it may not be that it'll be the last opportunity a person ever has to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. It may be that their heart will finally, simply, no longer be tender enough to respond to the invitation of Christ any longer. Now we know that technically speaking, as long as a person is alive, they have the opportunity to become obedient to God. But we also know that over time that becomes less and less likely. And that's one of the reasons why, number three, the examples of conversion that we have in Scripture are so important. And I'd like to look at a couple this morning as we conclude our thoughts. I want to go first to the book of Acts, to the second chapter of the book of Acts. And here's one of the, the, the great stories of the New Testament. Great stories in a number of ways, but... The day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, there were tens of thousands of people gathered together in the city of Jerusalem because of the events around the holiday, the holy days uh, that were there. And uh, as they gathered together, they weren't there for the, the gospel, but Jesus is going to be preached on this day. The Holy Spirit will fall out on the apostles. The gospel of Jesus Christ is going to find its its welcome into the hearts of men and women. I don't have time to read the text there, but I will give you some outline over the story. The apostles began to preach. It is early in the morning. And as Peter stands up and takes over from the other group, he first begins to quote from the Old Testament, from the prophet Joel, from the prophet David, and speaks about the fact that this is the time that God was looking forward to, the time when Jesus would come, the Messiah, the one who was always going to be there. The plan of God through prophecy had already been established. That Jesus was the Son of God, but He also became the Son of Man. He was the Messiah. He would also be the Savior. He would be the sacrifice for the sins of mankind. How did they respond as they heard these things? They listened. They heard. The, 20, the 37th verse tells us they were touched. Let's start reading there, Acts 2.36. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then in verse 40, And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who, were glad, then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Here we have the beginning this is the beginning of the church. This is the beginning of that preaching of the gospel. This is the beginning of the establishment of that group that would be there in the city of Jerusalem. And each one of these men and women had their beginning there. They heard the preaching of Jesus. They turned and they were obedient, just as David described in Psalm 119. 
But not only that, then we go a few chapters later, and we could stop any place we'd like to, but we'll stop in Acts chapter 8. And here we find a man in the last half of the book, the last half of the chapter, beginning in the 26th verse. We're going to have the, the backside of Philip's discussion. And Philip is going to be carried away from the city of Samaria where he was preaching out to the desert. And there he's going to be joined to a chariot. And in that chariot is going to be a man. And that man has traveled from Ethiopia all the way from Africa. He has come up to Jerusalem to worship. And now he is on his way home. And as he is on his way home, he is reading from the book of Isaiah. And while he's reading from Isaiah... The Holy Spirit calls Philip and says, Go join yourself to that chariot. And he goes up to the chariot. And he hears the man reading from Isaiah. And he asks him, Do you know what you're reading? And that would be insulting to many people. You go up to someone who's got a Bible open somewhere and you say, Do you know what you're reading? You may not get a very kind response. They may say, mind your own business. Who do you think you are? Well, this man uh, had no pride about himself. He wasn't offended by Philip's question. He said, I'm interested in knowing what's going on here. How can I know what this is unless someone should teach me or guide me along? And he asked Philip to come up into the chariot and join him. And then he asked him a question. Who is he talking about here? What is this about? Explain it to me. And it says that Philip, beginning at the very same verse that the Ethiopian was reading from, began to preach Jesus to him. Now, that's a great story all itself right there. But it even gets better. Start reading in verse 36. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? There are several interesting things that were going on, obviously, in that discussion. And one of them was, Philip had told him about the need to be baptized for the remission of sins. The preaching of Jesus cannot be separated from the obedient response of baptism. And here it is in the text. They're riding along. He's preaching Jesus to him. And it's the eunuch, not Philip. Philip does not say, don't you think this would be a good idea for you to be baptized? No, no. It's the Ethiopian eunuch who says, here's water. Why can't I be baptized? We could go on and find others. But we'll stop at just one more place. And that's in... The city of Philippi. In the city of Philippi, as we go into Acts chapter 16, we meet a woman named Lydia. And Lydia is a businesswoman. And Paul and his traveling companions have come through and they gather at a place where prayer was made. And they preach the word of God. And Lydia and her family respond in obedience to the word of God and they're baptized. Later, while Paul is in the same city, he and Silas will be thrown into prison. There he'll have an opportunity to preach to a jailer, to a man probably who's never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ before, and maybe would never have heard so if Paul had not been thrown into his prison. But he preaches to this man, and he also is baptized in the middle of the night. Later on in the very next chapter, as Paul goes on out of Philippi, finds himself in the city of Corinth in Acts chapter 18, verse 8. As Paul is there preaching to those people, it says many of the Corinthians believed, and those who were believing were baptized into Jesus Christ. These are beginnings. The beginnings of those who had gone from a state of disobedience to one who is obedient. It has been my practice over the number of years to put our, to use our bulletin to run photographs of those who have been baptized into Christ or place membership with us or a few other things, but especially those two. Right now we're a little behind. Got photographs of uh, about four of our young people that we have not yet run. Got a few from 
some older gentlemen who have recently been baptized into Christ. And I can't tell you how delighted I am. And I thank God for each one of those that have been baptized into Christ. But I'm also certain that there are more in this room who need to put on the Lord Jesus. There's some perhaps listening by means of our internet broadcast who need to change their life in obedience. And the question that comes up is, when will that be? And what if they wait too late? There's a wonderful passage of Scripture in Luke chapter 16. Jesus told the story about two men who died. One man was very wealthy. We only know him as a rich man. The other man is named. His name is Lazarus. He was very poor. But the story that Jesus tells is powerful for this reason. He talks about the rich man and Lazarus both passing away. They, are both, they both die. The rich man, it says concerning him, he died and was buried. He awakens in torment. And there he wishes he could do something else about his condition, but he cannot. He calls for Abraham to send Lazarus to dip his finger in water and come, to, come cool the, the tip of his tongue with water. But Abraham says, we, I can't come to you. You can't come to us. Lazarus can't come help you. There's a division that is fixed. You are where you're going to be and you're always going to be there. Well, if the, the rich man cannot have satisfaction for himself, the next request he makes is for his brethren who are still alive. He says, if he can't come help me, then send Lazarus back so that my brothers who are still alive can hear about this place and not come here. I think it is interesting that a man who apparently had no spiritual interest while he was alive, the moment he has passed into the great beyond and finds himself in a place of torment, immediately he becomes evangelistic. He wants his brothers told about the truth of God so that they can be saved. Isn't that interesting? There's another interesting verse there in Luke 16, verse 22. that says when the rich man, excuse me, when Lazarus died, he was carried by angels to Abraham's bosom. Think about that for just a moment. There's probably not a more frightening experience that we'll face than our own mortality, the time of our death. And imagine being there alone. There are a number of songs, music that's played regularly on the radio that I've heard that have addressed death and concept of loneliness. One of the songs that I have heard in the past by Rodney Crowell is he's talking about his father who passes away. And there's a phrase that's, that's very poignant. And he says, Although I was there with him, he died alone. There's a reality there there may be a whole host of people gathered in a room with a person, but there's only one who's going to die. And in that sense, we are all going to die alone. And yet there's a place where we will not be alone. Lazarus was not alone. The angels were there for him. And he was carried to a place of great comfort. And imagine that concept, that because he was one of God's children, he was carried to a place of great comfort. And that, that statement there by Jesus, that the angels carried him. The chapter previous to Luke chapter 16 is Luke chapter 15. Well, duh. 
15 comes before 16. Oh, well, you know what's in Luke chapter 15? Three of the most wonderful stories that Jesus told. Three parables. And they're all parables about lost people and about found people and about rejoicing. He tells a story about a lost sheep. The shepherd has 99 sheep. One is lost, and he goes and looks for that sheep, and he looks until he finds it. When he finds the sheep, he brings it back home, and he calls together his family, and he says, Rejoice with me, because the sheep that I've lost is found. And then you know what the Lord says about that? There is more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 who need no repentance. There's rejoicing in heaven when we make our lives right. Then he goes on and tells the next story. He tells a story about a woman who has these coins, and one of the coins is lost, and she looks until she finds that coin, and then she finds that coin, and then she brings her folks together, and she is rejoicing. And then the Lord adds the second layer and he says, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God in heaven over the sinner that repents. If you're not a Christian, let me speak to you earnestly for a moment. Every heart in this room is longing for you to come to Jesus. But it's not just those of us who are in this room who are longing. The angels in heaven are longing for you to, return, to come home. God himself is longing for you to come home. The Savior who bled and died for us is longing for you to come home. And there will be rejoicing uh, not only of those who are in this room, and I guarantee you every heart will rejoice and every eye will be moistened by those who understand that one has come to where they need to be and has come to serve God. But the angels in heaven will also rejoice. If you go back to Acts chapter 8 and read the rest of the story as the Ethiopian comes to this water and he says, see here's water, what hinders me from being baptized? And Philip says, if you believe you may. And they stop the chariot and they go down into the water and it says that Philip baptized him. And you know what it keeps saying there? After Philip baptized him? That the Ethiopian eunuch went on his way. What's the next word? Rejoicing. Why? Because he knew he was right. Will you let us rejoice with you today? The angels in heaven will rejoice. We will rejoice. God will rejoice. If your life is not as it should be, and you need to change it spiritually, we invite you to come and rejoice today in making your life right with God. In obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ, you can put on your Lord in baptism even this morning. Everything is in readiness. What would hold you back? Let us rejoice with you now while we stand and sing. Won't you come? <laughs>
Thank you, Tim. Appreciate the lesson. 510 will be our closing hymn this morning. We'll do the first and third stanzas for our closing prayer. Again, want to thank the elders. We'd like to thank everyone that uh, participated Friday night. It was uh, really a good spiritual uh, feast and physical feast as well. And I won't name names, but whether you came early to greet or brought a lot of food or just uh, showed up and sang and participated in whatever you did, we really appreciate it. It was kind of a good unified effort, and you really, really stepped up and did what we asked you to do, and that was really a good thing and, and uh, beneficial to everyone. Brother Holland, he had some physical uh, issues in being here, and he kind of took the extra effort to be here, and and uh, I appreciate what y'all did, we, we as eldership do. I think the first and third stanzas will be led in our closing prayer. <clears throat> oh, God, creator of all things we know, ruler of everything, a final authority, we praise you for those things alone, you're praiseworthy, but we also know you as Father, the embodiment of love, the caretaker of our souls, you are truly praiseworthy beyond all imagining. Father, we Thank you for this week, for the singing we had Friday, for the special way that singing touches our soul, lets us express the joy of being your children, and what great op greater opportunity have we for joy than to know that new souls have been added to your body that we can help each other grow and one day reach our reward with you. Father, be with us as we go forth in this week. Help us to seize every opportunity you give us to do good works. Forgive us when we fall short. Miss those opportunities. Spread your love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.